Good morning, everyone. Good, good. You're starting awake. That's a good sign. Um, actually, uh, my voice hopefully is going to hold out okay. Uh, I heard a bit of clapping when they mentioned the game is going to be on. Uh, my voice is still recovering from some of the activity. Uh, I live and work in Cambridge, which is a mostly Portuguese town uh, or city, and uh, it was pretty quiet after they lost to Germany. So. I've had a couple of uh, quiet nights, not a lot of honking horns and stuff like that to work on this presentation. And uh, basically what I wanted to share with you is uh, a bit of background on, on TMMC, uh, who we are. We'll talk about the upgrade that we uh, completed, uh, which went live at the beginning of this year. And then I'll, I'll talk about a couple of key strategies that we used to make sure that we were successful. Um, I will leave some time uh, for questions at the end. I like the way that it, was, it started off. It's all about you. And uh, my goal here is really just to share with you some of the ideas and experiences that I've had. And uh, afterwards, during the question period, or well, question period, but the, the time for questions, or uh, afterwards, if you have any questions or would like some more information, please don't hesitate uh, to ask. So a bit of background about Toyota manufacturing. Uh, the plant itself was opened in, in 85, or that's when it was announced. Uh, three years later, we were building cars. The, the first vehicle that we started building was the Kroll, and we still build that today. Um, we've had a number of milestones. I'm only going to touch upon a few key ones, but the underlying story here is about success. So throughout time, throughout the, the, ever, ever since uh, 85, when we were announced, because of our continued success, we've continued to prosper and grow. So during the uh, 94 to 99 time frame, we had an expansion of the plant that was announced. Basically, we doubled in size in our Cambridge facility, and we started building the Solera. So the Solera is the, the two-door coupe version of the Camry. It also comes in a, uh, a rag top or convertible. Um, and uh, again, uh, you can see by uh, the 1999 time frame, we had built our one millionth vehicle. Uh, in the 2000s, early 2000s, it was a busy time for us. Uh, in the year 2000 itself, it was announced that we were going to be the first plant outside of Japan to build the Lexus. And we still are currently the only plant outside of Japan that builds the, the Lexus vehicle. Uh, as far as recognition within Toyota, there really isn't a higher level of recognition than to build Lexus. So that's the, the crown jewel of, of the Lexus, uh, of the Toyota um, product line. So we build the, the th it was initially the 330, now the 350, and you'll see that we're, we're gearing up to build the hybrid version of that, the uh, 450. Uh, also in 2001, it was announced that we were going to be building the, the Matrix. So the Toyota Matrix is a, a two door, or sorry, a two or four door hatchback vehicle, um, still being built, although now it's currently only sold in Canada. And you can see, actually, uh, by uh, 2004, we were at our two millionth vehicle. Again, building on our success. Uh, in 2005, it was announced that Toyota was going to be building a plant in Woodstock. And basically, the, the Woodstock plant is an extension of our Cambridge facility. So we have two plants in Cambridge, and you'll see that momentarily. And we look at Woodstock just as a third plant. It's a little bit of a longer walk. It's about a half hour drive to get to Woodstock. So uh, again, uh, our, our reputation for quality and our reputation for success meant that we continue to grow. Uh, you can see in 2005, uh, sorry, 2007 was our three millionth uh, vehicle. You can see in 2010, we were at four million vehicles. Um, in 2012, we became the first Toyota plant in the world to build an electric only vehicle. So it was a partnership with Tesla, and we make the uh, all-electric RAV4, and that's currently just sold in the California market. And then, as I mentioned, uh, just this year, we launched the 450H, the hybrid version of the uh, Lexus SUV. And again, all, all these things are, are geared around success. Five million vehicles in, in 2012, and that rate is expanding. This year, we'll be producing over 600,000 vehicles uh, in a year. And that's, uh, that volume doesn't come by accident. 
And what, I'll, what I'd like to, to talk about later on then is how those factors for success we use in our SAP environment. So uh, a quick overview of the three plants. So uh, in Cambridge, our north plant, this is where we build the Corolla. Uh, that's the, the current Corolla. Hopefully uh, most of you are like me, thinks it looks a, a little bit nicer than the old Corolla. Uh, we're definitely getting a, a bit more aggressive in our styling, um, becoming uh, not only a, a product that people buy for quality, but also a product that looks great. Uh, we also build the matrix on that line. It's not, uh, it's not highlighted here just because it's a limited market, that market just being Canada. In the south plant, we build the, the 350 and the 450H. And then in Woodstock, we build the RAV4, and again, as I mentioned, the electric-only version of the RAV4, which is limited to the California market. Um, you can see some stats there. Our Cambridge facility is uh, 3 million square feet, all under one roof. Uh, the property itself, I think, is 700 acres. Uh, Woodstock is about a, a million acres. Uh, sorry, 100, let's try that back, 100 acres. Um, sorry, a thousand acres for Woodstock. And the, uh, between the two, uh, we employ over 8,000 uh, people, on the, not only on the line, but in administration as well. Uh, this year, we uh, have been swamped with production. The vehicle sales have been doing very well. Uh, the styling has definitely helped, and we continue to make improvements in quality. And uh, this year, in fact, we'll be, uh, for the first time, uh, peaking over 9,000 employees. So it's, it's a large facility. Some of the successes that we've had, uh, these are some of the JD Power Awards that we've won. The, the main one I, I like to highlight just on the top there is the Platinum Plant Award. So the Platinum Plant Award is uh, best assembly plant in the world. So in 2011, we achieved that. Um, it's the first time a Toyota plant outside of Japan has won that award. So it's uh, very significant for us. And uh, we have been continually recognized in the, in the business world as well. Uh, regularly listed, as you can see, as uh, one of Canada's top 100 employers, uh, as well in Waterloo, one of the greenest employers, uh, one of the top employers for uh, candidates over 40. I thought that was interesting. Uh, I saw a recent one, I think it was just a couple of days ago. Um, it was a top 100 most diverse employers in Canada and uh, TMMC was the only manufacturing company that was at the, the top of that segment. So uh, commonly recognized for our successes. Our, our chairman today uh, has been one of, the, uh, one of the leaders as far as thinking when it comes to SAP and some of the things that we want to do there. Uh, Ray Tange not only has a role in Canada, uh, previously um, he was the highest ranking non-Japanese person in Toyota. Uh, he's gearing towards retirement, so he's a little bit uh, taking a little slower pace now. But one of the things that he worked on when he was uh, chief quality officer for all of Toyota was this uh, vision that he came up with. And basically what I just wanted to share with you is that uh, Toyota is looking back at some of the, the core competencies and things that have made Toyota successful in the past and leveraging those to be successful again in the future. So everything from the Toyota way, the values that we hold, and those, those things come together and bear fruit and that's what you see at the top of the tree. This is uh, accessible from the, the Toyota website if you're interested in more details. So as I mentioned, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on the project that we did, uh, some of the key infrastructure strategies, and I'll talk about two concepts that, that made it um, particularly successful, the idea of sprinting and the need for control. So the upgrade itself, what we did is uh, we upgraded our software. So our, our software meaning pretty much everything. We upgraded from 4.7 to ECC 6. We upgraded the uh, database from Oracle 9 to 11. We upgraded the operating system. We went from uh, HPUX to Red Hat. We went from uh, using redundancies within HPUX to utilizing VMware, and we completely virtualized the environment. Uh, from a hardware side, we went to non-proprietary. 
So we use uh, x86 servers now. Um, and we uh, f basically have created a, a tier of infrastructure that SAP sits in as along with other uh, critical applications for us. We did all that activity, including 18 years of changes in our SAP environment. So we've been running SAP for 18 years. And I know what uh, 18 years of renovations in a house look like. You know what uh, 18 years of renovations to SAP looks like. So, uh, but with 18 years and two companies using it, so both TMMC use that and we also host the financial system for uh, Captain, which is a, uh, a manufacturing facility that Toyota owns in British Columbia. Um, so we host their SAP as well. So 18 years of changes, two companies, and we did it all in six months. And not only did we do it all, we did it all successfully. So, so how did we do that? So that's what I want to talk a little bit more in depth about some of the, the key things to make that type of project successful. Um, I thought this was uh, amusing, Dilbert. I know that uh, there's a fellow at work who sends out uh, the, the pretty much a, a daily Dilbert. It's, uh, they're usually a, a somewhat uh, realistic but inappropriate or, or, or something along those lines. But uh, when it comes to virtualization, that was one of the key items that we looked at when we redid our infrastructure. What we needed to ensure is, uh, although we wanted to virtualize for all the benefits of virtualization, I think most of us know at a high level at least the, the benefits around virtualization. But how do you do it in a way that is sustainable for your business? So uh, when we looked at um, ensuring the reliability of the, that environment, what we focused on was monitoring the environment. So currently now, we uh, basically pull the server, uh, servers in that environment for 600 different data points every minute. And what we're doing is collecting uh, different values that are not always usable at the beginning. What we actually um, notify people on or alert people on is really a handful of items. These are key uh, system metrics and you'll need to figure out what these are for your own businesses. But what we didn't want to do is swamp people with, with so many emails and so many notifications that it only triggers you to create a spam rule and therefore gets it out of your inbox. So instead, we focus on some key metrics, but then we collect all this other information because what we find is that we're uh, using this information to understand trending. We're using this inf information for root cause analysis. So we had something um, unusual happen last week. Why did it happen? Well, if we have data that we can go back into, we can look for anomalies in that data. And we can say, you know what, there was this unusual dip last week and it doesn't seem to occur in the data set for previous weeks. Could this be related somehow? And what it means is that we're able to uh, decrease our mean time to uh, determine root cause and it gives us more data to understand the environment and trend for future requirements. Redundancy, obviously I think we all understand the requirements for redundancies. Our goal is to use VMware redundancies as much as possible. What we have right now is a, a fully redundant system where we uh, replicate data real time between our two data centers in Cambridge. And then we have a backup of that on a daily basis that gets uh, sent over to our Woodstock facility. So our disaster recovery planning, therefore, gets built into that. So what we do is uh, whenever we need to do a refresh of our QA environment or sandbox environment, the way we do that now is we basically take a backup and we do a disaster recovery test. We recover our production system fully, make sure it's working, and then we change it into QA or change it into sandbox. What it means is that our, our disaster recovery process isn't theoretical anymore. It isn't something that we practice once a year and hope to remember when we need it. It means that we're practicing at any time or every time that we're doing a QA refresh or a sandbox refresh. And obviously one of the key areas for us for uh, reliability is around change management. Uh, we use the ITIL process, uh, we wrap that around our change management, but also it's leveraging people's experience. So uh, the, the key element when it comes to, uh, or one of the key elements with Toyota is the human element. Uh, people understand risks, people understand or, or have experience 
and can help to uh, highlight where there's potential risk. So we, we try to get that feedback from as many people as possible before making changes in the environment so we can truly ensure that we have a, a, st a stable, reliable infrastructure. Uh, we use VMware extensively for scalability. In the HPUX side, um, just a quick poll, I'm kind of curious. Um, how many people run SAP on Unix? Uh, some fl one flavor or another of Unix? A few, not as many as I thought. How about uh, Linux? One person? <laughs> Sorry? Uh, just so very few. So I, I'm, we're in the same boat. We're in the, the Linux shop. Yeah. yeah. Um, then uh, how about Windows? Wow, I didn't expect that. More Windows than, uh, than Linux. Okay. So uh, for us, the uh, running, uh, we, it was a critical for us to get onto an x86 platform for the cost savings. Um, what we found in the HPUX side uh, running on Itanium is that the scalability is, is difficult. It's, it's difficult both from a, from a technical side, it's also difficult from a cost side. So uh, whether it's something as simple as adding memory to the box, it's not commodity memory and y you pay a premium for that. And it's not a, a knock to HP at all. I think all the vendors who provide a, a premium type of product will have that type of price point associated with it. But our goal was to have a, a, a product or a, an infrastructure that we could scale quickly, easily, and cost effectively. And so uh, for our virtual infrastructure then, what, as I said, the, the plan is to, and what we uh, accomplished was a tier of infrastructure using VMware, using commodity x86 boxes that we put not only SAP into, but any application that has that same business criticality, that same business requirement, goes into that, that tier of storage and, and, and tier of servers. And therefore, it's, it's now a commodity. So if I say uh, SAP is critical, that's where it goes. If I say that I have a, um, a, a Gentran for Unix, if I've got a faxing application, if I've got uh, some sort of EDI or, or anything else that has that same business criticality, it goes into that same tier. Same tier of server, same tier of infrastructure. It gets the same redundancies, it gets the same scalability, it gets the same service as SAP has. So for scalability then, what we were able to do is build the environment where cost effectively we can implement it and have the ability to scale 300 percent based off of standard commodity servers. So where we are at with our footprint today, we can triple it in size without any additional uh, infrastructure investment. Okay. Then because it's commodity based, because it's a tier of infrastructure, if we need to add more capacity into that environment, we can increase it to 700 percent of what we currently have today by just buying additional capacity for that infrastructure. So we're not having to buy something special for SAP. We don't have to buy something special from a, from a certain vendor. What we do is just buy capacity into that tier. And then longer term, we know that if we need to scale above 700%, that's where we're looking and doing some uh, POC work around HANA and um, to understand how we can leverage that type of performance increase uh, above what we currently require in the, in the near or short, short term. Um, again, VMware, one of the key things is it's, it's portable. We can move it. So if uh, today we decide we want to run it in Cambridge, that's great. If tomorrow we decide we want to run it in one of those Bell data centers that uh, we were talking about, we can do that. Um, or maybe we want to do something in between. We've abstracted everything except for um, the actual server names themselves. Uh, IP is, uh, it, we're no longer dependent on a specific IP, we're no longer dependent on storage or, or, or servers. The only thing that we require is that wherever it hosts it supports the VMware. And either most companies do or they have a method to get you from VMware to whatever they provide, uh, if it's OpenStack or something else. We talked a bit about uh, cost, uh, cost effectiveness. Um, so again, x86 was the key driver of that. Uh, Red Hat as the OS, we looked at um, different uh, Unix platforms. 
Um, no matter the different flavor that we looked at, they seemed to fall within a certain price point and it uh, led, led us more to the Linux side. The, the reason that we went with Linux rather than Windows, I think w Windows is a, is a good platform as well. Um, actually would have been my, my preference, but uh, from my group's perspective, they, they have years of Unix experience. And as uh, some of you may have experienced when you try to get a, a Unix person to work on Windows, um, it's almost like an allergy arises. So uh, there's a, uh, I think that the transition to Linux was a, a, the right step for us. It allowed us to get to a, something that's more cost effective, um, modern tools, and it, uh, it gives us an opportunity for the team members to learn something new. And they're, they're understanding VMware more, they're understanding that, uh, that tier of uh, service that we provide. And there's Windows boxes in there, and they're starting to get exposed to it. So I think um, potentially in some future date, we may consider uh, Windows as the OS. And finally, around security, obviously uh, that's something that's, that's critical. And when we manage uh, two different companies within, within the same SAP instance, it's critical for us to have uh, security, that there's segregation of data. Uh, we do that primarily through the audit process. We have our own internal audits. Uh, where we, the, the team members themselves, uh, understand the, what the requirements are. They're looking through the system, trying to find any kind of an anomalies there. We use uh, internal financial audits. So uh, we have PwC and Deloitte come through and, and do both internal and external audits for us. We also use SAP. And so we've, uh, there's times when, for example, setting up company codes it's not something that we do on a daily basis. So we focus on getting people with specialized skills that uh, do, you know, do this on a regular basis that can come in and help us ensure that the security is set up correctly. And then again, change management. Because upgrading a system in, in six months, and six months is from project approval to uh, project closure in six months, we, d we d can't do that with 18 years of changes if we don't have good change management. So we need to know what's, what's happening in that system. We need to make sure that uh, we're not creating unnecessary customizations and leverage the product for, um, for what it is. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about two strategies that we use, uh, we use for this project. One is uh, sprinting. I thought this was kind of a, a neat picture there. Uh, one of the websites I looked at said that uh, running is a culture. So if you go to uh, Sport Check or any of those stores and you look at running shoes, um, there isn't one running shoe. There's a whole plethora of running shoes out there. And there's a whole culture. Any, anybody here run marathons? There's a few crazy people here. OK. There's uh, I, uh, something that I'm interested in doing myself, uh, but it's uh, it is a, it's, a, it's a culture around running. There's challenges that are, are unique to it. And I think that uh, we use the term sprinting when we talk about how we run projects. And I think likewise, when it comes to running a project, there needs to be a culture there. So how do you create a, a culture of sprinting? Um, and that's what we've been working on and I'll talk a little bit about. In order to, to sprint, you have to get rid of unnecessary baggage. Um, I, I know if you're like me, if you're running, you're not looking to carry a, a lot of extra weight. And when it comes to projects, we have to do the same thing. We can't carry a lot of extra baggage with us. You know, scope creep and all these different things that we want to add on to the project. It's trying to sprint but by, by putting extra bags and, and uh, luggage onto somebody as they're trying to sprint. So for us, it's key to have a clear and reasonable scope. And one of the key ways that we're able to achieve that is by having short time frames for projects. If I say, you know what, I need to do this project, it's going to be three years, and you know, I can't have any scope creep over that time, I'm not going to get any buy-in for that. But if I say, you know what, I've got a project, and it's two weeks, and, I, and I, you know, not gonna have, uh, I'm going to have a clear, concise scope, and I, and I, I don't want uh, scope creep, people are more uh, willing to accommodate that. And so for the upgrade, 
when we looked at uh, six months, there was a, a planning phase within that. And uh, at that time, we made the uh, schedule as aggressive as possible so that we can ensure that from the business side, there wasn't a lot of pushback about additional scope just because of the time that we're taking to do the project. Um, quick uh, measurable tasks and timelines. Um, I'm going to show you an example of that and clear responsibility as well. These are not rocket science. We know these things. But the trick is how do we actually in some way implement this? Uh, and visibility as well. I'm going to pass this slide here. I'm going to talk to it. This is just uh, an example. I know it's not readable. But what it is, is it's a, it's a one-page uh, project scorecard. So this is how we run our projects now. It has to fit on a single page. I don't want emails with a, a lot of text. We're, uh, basically, on here, it's uh, fairly small. This is a whole uh, upgrade would fit on a project like this. Uh, we break down the tasks. Every task, uh, there would be columns there for that task performed in dev, in QA, in production, if, it's just, if the sandbox is involved in that sandbox. Every task has a, a scheduled date. Every task has an owner. And then we use uh, the circle triangle X, right? Green, yellow, red conditions. So this gets reviewed by senior management. And this is what we review on a daily basis. Every day we go back to this. This task was due tomorrow. Are we going to be on, on target for it? I, I don't know. I haven't gotten an update on it. Well, this task is assigned to so-and-so so is responsible. They may or may not be doing the work, but they're responsible for it. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll shoot them off an email, give them a quick call. By the way, you know your task is due tomorrow. Uh, you know, please be prepared to, uh, to report on it tomorrow and let us know how this is going. If a task is, uh, passes that timeline, we know who to talk to and we know who to escalate to. We know who's responsible, we know who their management is. And so we say, you know, hey, you know, I think this person needs some help. This was a, a, a timeline that was due two days ago. It's still not accomplished. Um, you know, what do we need to do to get this done so then the, the project can continue to move along? So, this is uh, so some of the things I talked about in the previous slide here. So uh, measurable tasks, clear responsibility, visibility, and the group, the working groups have to be small. They have to be small. If you look at um, uh, agile uh, program development, uh, if you look at some of the principles in there around uh, scrum uh, concepts and that sort of thing, the key is around small fast working groups. And that's uh, one of the key things in, in, this, in this meeting that we hold on a daily basis. It's about half a dozen key people reporting on the statuses and then anybody else who's, uh, who's attending is there because of some sort of exception reporting. Because there's some kind of issue that we need to address in order to keep on target. The other thing I want to talk about briefly is control. Um, I thought this was a great slide. Hopefully that's readable there. I like the, uh, I like the, the bottom second to uh, the right there, the, uh, the eye swing. Of course, that's uh, appropriate. <laughs> so I think uh, people uh, know that this happens in projects. Why? Why does this happen? It happens because there isn't control. Because there's different people working in different groups uh, and you, you, it's that phone chain. We know that when we, um, when we communicate, people misinterpret, people extrapolate. So it's, again, key to have uh, small working groups. We, it's important for us to maintain project management internally. Um, I ran that, uh, that upgrade project. I was the project manager for it. Um, I reviewed any significant changes to scope. I reviewed all significant work. I would look at the work myself. I would talk to the team members who are doing on it, uh, doing that work. So it's, uh, it's critical for us that we maintain that ourselves. Uh, I, I would strongly encourage, um, based off of our experience, 
uh, that you maintain project management internally. Um, and we use the approach of staff augmentation. And Bell Createch has been a great partner for us uh, in this regard. What we do is, um, rather than outsource sections of project, what we do is we uh, grab uh, some resources from Createch and pull them into the project. And we might have somebody there for two months, we might have somebody there for two weeks, depending what the requirement is, what the need is. But they're integrating into the team. They're not working off on their own. We want them on site. We want them part of the group. And that way, when they go, th there is that continuation. People understand and are able to support the environment afterwards. As I mentioned, we bring in specialized people for specialized tasks, but we, we don't uh, do a lot of those um, umbrella POs, you know, where we're, we're uh, handing over control on a large scale. It's important for us, I'm just going to fill out this PowerPoint here. It's important for us to, to centralize and standardize. So uh, again, just that morning meeting alone brings people into one central location, brings the conversation to one standard conversation. We all know what we're going to look at. We're all going to look at that report. We're all going to talk about it in the same way, use the same language, and that's powerful. It's, it's simple, but it's powerful. And then the uh, last point that I have here is around maintaining customer trust. So when you deliver on a project like this, you gain the customer's trust. Then you say to them, you know what, I want to do something else. I want to go to HANA. I want to do, you know, uh, roll out another feature in SAP. Based off of the success that you have in your, your daily activities, based off the success that you have in your projects, you win the trust of your customers, and then you have this, the opportunity to do more work. So the same way that Toyota, we've, our, our company, TMMC, has continued to grow, because of the trust that we've earned from Toyota. We keep, we've built Lexus not because uh, it was an accident, we built it because we earned that trust. In the same way, I need to earn the trust of my customers. And uh, I do that by delivering projects on schedule, on time, on budget. So just a, a kind of a, an interesting slide here. Um, this is a, a few of the vehicles that uh, we'd like to manufacture one day. So the top right is um, potentially the next Toyota Supra. Um, so that's a, an FT concept, FT1. The, the bottom left is uh, the uh, uh, concept of the hydrogen vehicle that uh, Toyota will be manufacturing. So uh, we're moving very heavily into, in, into hydrogen. Uh, we'll be mass producing the, uh, our first hydrogen vehicle um, in Japan uh, by the end of this year. And we uh, see that being a, a good market, an opportunity for us to con continue growing. And if we want to build these ve vehicles in Canada, then we need to uh, gain the trust of Toyota um, by delivering. And, th and that's basically what I wanted to, to talk to you about today. I want to leave a, a few minutes for questions. Um, any, any questions? Uh, fault tolerance wasn't an option for us because there's a um, uh, limitation as far as the guest sizes. And so th the, those limitations are too, are too small for our environment. Um, we actually, what we ended up doing is the base uh, recovery features within VMware, uh, specifically vMotion, allows us to proactively move a, uh, a guest with zero downtime, and we've used that feature extensively. For uh, failure uh, situations, what we do is uh, currently we're actually, we took a step backwards and, and are only doing a manual failover right now for uh, an actual server down, uh, no proactive uh, failover. What we're doing is looking at, um, we're currently implementing HA, so uh, that's, uh, we're looking at site recovery as well, but um, basically just the, the HA features within v VMware. There is um, Symantec makes a product, a product called um, Application HA that basically bolts onto VMware, gives VMware um, application intelligence, and so will be more similar to some of the features that um, Unix 
clustering or that sort of thing has where it actually understands the, the st status of the application and will fail over even if the infrastructure is fine for a an application level issue it'll uh, uh, trigger that failover. And one just quick follow up question to that. To get the performance you mentioned you were fully virtual, do you have to uh, dedicate those resources on the physical host? So uh, the question is did we need to d uh, dedicate resources on the physical hosts? Um, what we did is we, we purchased uh, physical hosts and ended up using them f for SAP, but uh, currently, because it's just in that tier, it's becoming more mixed in that environment. So the SAP servers start spreading across multiple uh, hosts. So in that, in, in, in that environment now, I think that we're up to uh, half a dozen hosts and they are, uh, SAP moves amongst those depending on either workload or if we're doing some sort of maintenance. Yeah. What's the environment and the size of the SAP and what was the downtime? <coughs> I'm sorry. How much downtime? Um, the SAP size, I don't remember offhand. Um, it was a, uh, a five terabyte database. Um, it was, uh, which we, we turned on compression, which worked very well for us, by the way. Um, the, uh, th sorry, the second part of your question was uh, how much downtime? Um, because of the type of um, upgrade that we were doing, and in particular the Oracle side of the upgrade, going from 9 to 11 and changing platforms as well, uh, it was there's not a native way of, of moving data across. The uh, IDNS of the two databases are different. And therefore, um, what we did is we created a process where we streamed um, exports out of Oracle. And at the same time, once those exports of, of large tables um, completed, we scripted imports into it. So created our own kind of in-house uh, streaming process for that upgrade. We're, we're streaming data out through exports of Oracle on HPUX and then streaming them in um, at the same time on the uh, Linux side. Uh, we also then used uh, uh, R3 load to do the, the remainder of the small tables where it'd just be too much time to script all that. Uh, between, be between all that activity, we took, I think it was a four day downtime window. And we did that over Christmas holidays um, and went live January 1st. So we're using, um, it, it's not uh, proprietary. Uh, anything that we're doing in that size is not proprietary because VMware adds a virtualization to that storage. Uh, we currently use uh, HP 3PAR as our, as our current storage, but um, we could as easily use any other storage product as long as they support the VMDK file format. Um, we use ServiceNow, um, but the, the tool is the easy part. <laughs> the, 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 I'm a, a big believer of uh, get the, f the process in, done, get, get people using the right process, and then figure out the tool side. So uh, we are relentless around change management. So I want to see changes for just about anything. The level of approval may be minimal for changes that are low risk and well understood. But just the, the documentation and the, the most important thing from, that I push with change management is that in change management, <coughs> one of the required fields is understanding the risks involved. People don't intuitively think about risks. So by going through the change management process, they have to think about risk. What am I touching? How am I touching it? What could it impact and, eff and, and affect? And more times than not, it's, it stops people and gives them that second sober thought. So th that's the, the key driver for us around change management. Back. Yep. 
Um, so uh, the first question was how long was the, the team, or sorry, how large was the team? Um, on the basis side, I have uh, two basis folks that, uh, one of the hats that they wear is basis. Um, they wear uh, database and, and other hats as well. So uh, they were the, the two internal resources that also supported uh, operational work at the same time. And then we had uh, two uh, Cretech resources um, for the majority of that project that supported from a basis side. They were the, the key ones that, uh, for example, created the scripts to dump the data and import it in, to do uh, the initial uh, confirmation checks of the environment. And they were dedicated so then I knew that no matter what happened or operationally, these guys had some horsepower to get the, the project done. Um, on the application side, um, there were three people that we, we brought in um, to help us on the application side. Um, and it's really to, uh, one of the key activities there was building the test cases with the users. Our, our users are extremely busy as we are and um, to expect them to build the, the test cases required was uh, unreasonable. So we brought in some help to, to do that. And then also uh, you know, there are tweaks and changes that need to be made in order to, uh, to go from 4.7 to 6. I've got one minute. One more question. One more question, okay. Might be a 10 minute question. Um, we don't, uh, the question is do we use an automated uh, testing tool? Um, we don't currently. Uh, we have looked at them. Um, they, are ex they are expensive and time consuming to, to create. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I worry a bit about is that I need my team to understand the, uh, the, what we're doing. And there's, from my side, I'm not comfortable yet to know that if, they, uh, if we automate that, that testing, then will people lose touch with the system? And then they're simply pressing a button and looking for results, but they no longer understand, you know, what are those tests? How are they working in the back end? Um, you know, if there's um, some sort of change in the environment, are they going to understand how that changes test plans and that sort of thing? So there's a, a balance there between automating and having some, a human person look at it and make decision points and, and be hands-on. So the automated testing tools, for us, we're, we're not quite ready for that yet. Okay, thanks very much.